Hello everyone and welcome back to the Pop Culture with Maddie podcast. So I am on the floor today because my phone needs to charge and this is the size I can give my stand with my phone cord. Um, I am going to be talking about three more decoms, Can of Worms, 13th Year, and Smart House. I did actually watch a lot of other movies this week so in turn after this I might give you guys a bonus episode a couple in a couple of days talking about the other movies I watched last week up until yesterday from the previous two weeks because I've watched a lot of other really great movies and I just kind of want to give a hash out little bonus for you guys so stay tuned and one of them was the new anyone but you rom-com so if you're interested in that please let me know okay so can of worms is probably one of the weirdest movies I've ever seen in my life um this is like an alien invasion movie but it's a Disney Channel movie, so it looks a bit weird. So Mike Pillsbury is a teen scientist and he is on the football team and it's basically because his dad like wants him to be. Like he's not on the football team because he wants to be, it's more so because like his dad wants him to be. And so he comes to his dad one day and he's like, I don't want to do football anymore. And his dad's like, just stick it out, it'll be fine. Um, he gets bullied a bit by Scott, and Scott is like the perfect guy, like the f football player, he's got all the grades, he's the head jock, etc. And, well, Mike is kind of a nerd. He's a scientist. He's smart. He knows how to use computers. He's like everybody's guy to computers all the time. So he doesn't really want to do football anymore after he gets like a head injury. Like I said, his dad wants him to keep playing. So he has a crush on this head cheerleader named Caitlin, and one day she comes up to him and she's like, hey, I want to do this cool thing for the school dance. Uh, I would like your help. And of course he helps her because, like, he's getting a chance to talk to the head cheerleader who he likes. So why not? So they set up the technology and then he tells, she asks him to tell her a story because apparently he tells really good stories. And then he asks her to join them for lunch, but after he makes, oh, sorry, my bad. So Scott shows up and he's like, hey, come to lunch with us uh, to um, Caitlin. And Mike is obviously not invited. So she says no, because surprise, surprise, Caitlin likes the nerd. And so she goes out with Mike and because he, Scott didn't get a yes, uh, he stays behind and he decides to mess with Mike's technology setup that he has going on for the school dance. So everything kind of goes crazy at the dance because of what Scott did. So then Mike is very distraught, very upset. And he runs off and he runs home and he decides to send a message into outer space. And the message reaches basically like every planet in outer space. And first a talking dog shows up, which is an alien from some planet. And other aliens start showing up through a stargate, which is what they call like the little portal between the dimensions or Earths or whatever. He tries to call, oh, was, Caitlin tries to call to apologize for being mean to him at school because after the after the dance, you know, at school that day, he, she kind of just like pretended like she didn't know him. She wasn't really his friend, whatever. And while he's on the phone one of those aliens showed up and it ends up in a weird conversation and so he doesn't you know really get his apology from Caitlin because he's being mean to her even though he's not being mean to her he's talking to the alien but she doesn't know that so it's miscommunication all the time He tries to ask for a second chance, but the dog finds him again. He's opened a can of worms, which is what the name of the movie is, and more and more aliens show up and he doesn't know what to do. Um, Caitlin tries to give him back his sweater, and so he tells her for a while she gave him the feeling of belonging, and that was why he waited until after the dance to send out the message, because he didn't feel like he belonged, but Caitlin made him feel like he belonged. And so he decides to pick an alien to leave with but the throat shows up and the throat is this crazy basically villainous one who wants a perfect specimen and he's gonna find it and so he thinks it's mike but he takes 
another kid, not Mike. And so they have to figure out a plan to save the other kid. Um, so Mike decides to call out Scott for messing up the dance and it's a trap to get him there so he can be the bait for the aliens. So they use Scott as bait to catch because he's a perfect specimen as we've already stated, and they catch him, and so then they get into the portal too, and they find a way to um, go get like them out, and they set free all of the aliens. The third comes back to them and is mad because they set everybody free, but Barnabas calls the police, and the third is arrested. Earth is safe, no longer a threat, and Mike... Barnabas tells Mike he could still come home with him, but Mike decides to stay on Earth because that is where he belongs. Weird. This is a weird movie. That was basically a recap of the movie. Pretty much everything that happened. Um, so now you don't need to watch it. Of all the DCOMs I've watched ever and also just lately because I've, I'm going to keep watching DCOMs, this, this is not one I would recommend. Um, the other two that I watched this week were much better, so. Sorry I did not post an episode last week, by the way. Just wanted to say I literally just didn't watch any of the movies. Like, I, I got through half of Can of Worms before Monday, and so I was like, I'll just delay a week. Because I have two more movies to watch, and I just didn't want to do it in such a short span of time. Okay, so the next movie is The 13th Year. Now, this is one I had seen previously I'd seen all, I've seen most of these previously let me be honest but a lot of them I didn't watch until the like 100th decom came out and they did a marathon of all of the movies and I recorded a bunch I'd never seen and watched them but some I had actually seen prior to that and this is one of them I think this is a fun movie this is the one where he turns into a mermaid merman if you will so just to sum it all up Cody is a young boy who's soon to be 13. When he was a baby, a mermaid is trying to get away from this man who's trying to catch a mermaid, puts him in a basket on a ship, and to, uh, intending to get back to the basket to get back to her baby. But the couple on the boat found the baby and took the baby in. So for the first 13 years of his life, he's been raised by this adoptive family because, well, they didn't know anything about his birth parents, obviously, because they didn't anticipate that it would be a mermaid and so they don't understand so there's that whole thing when we catch up to the present day of the story he's on a boat trying to get to his swim meet because his parents boat like breaks down or whatever so he has to um, take the ferry well he misses the ferry so then he swims all the way there to the other side of the dock where he needs to be to get to the swim meet and he barely makes it but he makes it to a swim meet and of course they win he gets second place. Yeah. Now, the guy who initially sees the mermaid and trying to catch him is Big John, and he has a son named Cody. No. What's his son's name? Jess. His son's name is Jess. And so, um, Jess is at the swim meet, and he falls into the pool, and Cody saves him. And then he goes home and, you know, get on to the next day. The next day at school, they get paired together for an assignment, Cody and Jess, and it has to be on marine biology. Well, Jess is an expert on marine biology because his dad's been researching it his whole life, which is, you know, as we know, he's looking for a mermaid, trying to catch a mermaid because he found one. And nobody believes that he really saw a mermaid that day. Like, nobody. But he really did. So he tells Jess he can come by the next day if he wants, but it's his birthday. Jess does show up, and he doesn't really stay loyal. Sam is one of Cody's friends who he kind of has a crush on, and she follows him into the house and they have a little kiss before some electricity comes out because that's one of the things that's been going on. So Cody has been experiencing these really weird symptoms because he's turning into a merman. And um, 
things just keep getting crazy because of that. His father finds one last present, a 20,000 leagues under the sea book, which I assume Jess got for him and left behind because he did not stay at the party. The next day, um, after he dreams of a life underwater, he fries his alarm clock with electricity and the milk carton starts sticking him. So he decides to go see Jess because he doesn't understand what's going on and Jess knowing marine biology might have an explanation for all this stuff, especially because he now has fish scales on his hand. So he's really looking fishy and weird and it's like, what the heck is going on with me? After a while, he... After he goes to Jess, he decides that Jess can tutor him in biology and he'll do whatever Jess wants and Jess asks for him to teach him how to swim because Jess does not know how to swim. That's why he needed saving from the pool that day. So then he decides to tell his parents about the stuff going on, but they don't believe him until finally he's like stuck to the ceiling and they're like, okay, let's call a doctor. But of course the doctor finds nothing wrong because there's nothing wrong with Cody. He's just turning into a merman and there's no scientific explanation for that in 1999. <laughs> His scales start showing up again, which seems to happen when he's wet sometimes, but not all the time. He goes to Jess again and Je asks him to take some tests. And Jess, later on, talking to his dad, decides to ask his dad about mermaids because he has this theory that Cody is a mermaid. And so they talk about the mermaid stuff again, and ultimately decide that Cody should not swim at his next meet or ever again because until they figure out what's going on with him because things are progressing pretty fast. He ends up going to his next big meet anyway, and he gets full on, like, I don't even know, on his arm. Like, it's uh, crazy. And so... His parents show up to drive him home and then they worry that anybody knows. Um, his teammate Sean kind of noticed something and Sam comes over to check on him and she sees the fish scales and she freaks out. So Big John gets Cody because Cody goes out to the beach um, one day and um, he like has flippers and everything like he's like a full mermaid basically and so Big John's like using him to I guess show that he really did find a mermaid and he finds that Cody's mom, the, the mermaid he found originally again so he's gonna catch her. But Cody's like no and so Jess shows up right in time and Jess cuts her out of the net but then Jess gets stuck in the net and Cody has to save him which he barely is able to do because he jumps on and so Big John decides to forget the whole thing because his son almost died. He was having like a pain like really bad because he was growing these flippers and stuff and so it's like so Jess went to go get his parents too his adoptive parents so everybody is there at the dock and Sam has to do CPR on Jess because Jess almost drowned. Cody uses his electricity to revive him. John finally realizes that, like I said, mermaids don't matter as much as the sun. And the mermaid comes back and Cody goes with her. His adoptive mom doesn't want to let him go, but she does because he'll be back before school starts. They just need to get an understanding of what's going on with Cody. Everyone says goodbye, he gets a full tail, and he does a big dive as he swims off. So this one's a fun one because it's a mermaid movie and if you've ever wanted to be a mermaid this is like the movie to watch. Um, I think it's interesting that it's like a thing when he turns 13. I think that's cool that they did that. Like it's like a genetic thing. It's really cool. Um, the casting in those movies is also pretty cool. They have uh, one girl in it who's in a couple of decoms. Um, it's pretty fun. Smart House. Smart House has some fun casting as well. Uh, the guy who's the main character, Ben Cooper, is in a couple of decoms and then went on to play on Pretty Little Liars. His dad in this movie is also the dad in Cinderella Story to Chad McAmory's character and Peyton's dad in Winter Hill. And I loved noticing that because that was really fun. So Smart House is about the teenager Ben Cooper who is lost his mother in the last, I don't know how many years. We don't really find out when he, when she died, but he lost his mother. And so their family's been basically making it work by him 
cooking and helping out around the house for his dad and his sister because it's a lot of work. So he keeps entering this competition to win this, to basically to live in this smart house. And this smart house is a really cool designed house by this woman named Sarah. And it's got like floor vaporizers that can like absorb the food. It can make the food for you. It can, um, play stuff like on, on the wall, like as a whole like wall screen, like it has all kinds of awesome capabilities, completely designed by Sarah. So it is definitely something that would be beneficial to the Cooper family because of how hard it is for them to get stuff done. He ends up winning the competition, of course. And so they get to see a demonstration of the house by Sarah who designed it before she leaves and they get the phone number for Sarah, of course, because the house already has it. Well, later on that night, um, the daughter, Ben's little sister, asks for a smoothie, but there was a malfunction, so they have Sarah come over and check it out, and everything's okay, and he decides to let her stay for dinner, and Nick, the father, decides to ask her out. Ben gets beat up at school for not doing his bully's homework and listening to his dad's advice to stand up to him because he had the smart house doing the homework and, you know, he forgot to do it and it was going to be a problem. So the house gets really upset by this because instead of it just being like a normal computer thing, this house kind of starts to develop like a maternal motherly like feeling emotions almost. And so she gets really kind of possessive of the people in this house and that's something to note for later. Um, when their dad's on the date with Sarah, Pat lets them throw a party, and of course Pat has invited this bully who beat up Ben so that she can torment him at the party. They almost get away with the party, but there's a jacket left on a plant, so they of course tell their dad that they had a party, and he is very upset with them, so he decides to tell the house to really buckle down. But Pat, the house, Pat is the... AI of the house, it's an AI kind of thing, decides to take it way too far. And they decide to do an override system shutdown that Sarah does so that she can fix the problem. Well, Pat overrides the shutdown and creates a virtual component of herself. And that virtual component kicks Sarah out because she's going to be their new mom. She can do everything for them. And she decides that the world is awful and that they need to stay at home. And after many tries of getting them to, of them getting, trying to get Pat to um, let them out of the house, it does not work. They decide to come up with a plan. So Sarah, whenever they, the paper comes, the house is like this hand that comes out to get the paper. She's going to jump through that hole right before and try to break into the control room to fix it. But she gets caught by Pat. And so Pat goes full tornado crazy and literally creates a tornado. And Ben decides to stand up and say, hey, look what they just did for us, Sarah and my dad. They were able to, they protected us when you just went crazy. You can't do that because you can't really touch us because you're not real. And that's when Pat decides to just sh cancel the virtual um, self. Her, <laughs> She destroys her virtual self and frees them. And lets them go back to their normal life and Sarah gets Pat back to normal and everything is good again. That's the quickest recap I think I've ever done. Um, this is a really fun movie. It makes you think like crazy things. I can't believe that they in 1999 came up with this crazy smart house idea with an AI assistant and now we have AI assistants everywhere. Now they can't do as much as Pat could but I mean floor absorbers would be awesome. I would love some if somebody could get on that. Uh, that's the only thing I, I want. <laughs> I don't need my smart house to make me food. I just want stuff to disappear when I want it to. Let me just throw it on the floor. Bye. <laughs> Literally, I think it'd be so great. So anyway, that is all for the decoms for this episode. I want to give you guys a bonus. The movies I watched this week because I've watched a few. So let me pull up that list really quick. Oh, 
Okay. So upgraded. No, I'm not gonna start with that one. I'm gonna start with so I watched Shrek. I've seen Shrek a million times, bring it on. There's just a few I wanted to talk about. They were like newer ones that I hadn't seen before, not ones that I've seen before. So let's start with Mean Girls. Um, I did watch Mean Girls for the first time back in January and I do have a episode where I talked about Mean Girls, but I did watch it again and I kind of wanted to talk about some of the differences that I noticed that I really wanted to discuss. I have a whole a TikTok where I talked about it, but I just wanted a little more for the recap. So compared to the 2004 version, obviously the most notable difference in the 2024 version is that it's a musical, but they do have some things that are from the Broadway version and not the 2004 version. And so I wanted to note some of those differences for you guys. So for one, Janice isn't a lesbian in the 2004 movie version, but she is in 2024. So the whole arrangement of like why Janice hates Regina is on a whole new level of crazy. I'm not going to tell you guys that. I want you to go watch the movie, but it is pretty insane. Um, line deliveries aren't the same for the lines that were in the 2004 version. And I think the final major difference I really wanted to say was, um, what was it? Oh, so because of the whole revenge party number, the winter talent show is like the end of the revenge on Regina, where they really didn't have to do much more after that. Whereas in the 2004 version, there was still a lot to be done, like they hadn't really done much before the winter dance thing. And so there's a big major difference in like length and time of how much happened. Okay. Wonka. I watched the new Willy Wonka movie Wonka and I have to say it was fun. Timothy Chalamet actually isn't a terrible singer. Um, I was a little worried about the singing but you know why not and uh, it was pretty good. I liked the pure imagination moment. I liked it. I just felt like I needed an understanding of why Willy Wonka is as crazy mad as he is in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, which this is a prequel to. And so I I don't know if they're going to do a sequel, if they're going to do more. I thought maybe this movie would get there, but this movie is just purely him getting his Chocolate Factory. Which he doesn't get to the end of the movie. And of course it has that iconic moment where he is covered in chocolate that everybody on TikTok had to talk about. And I was not ready, even though I knew it was there. Because I forgot. Okay, I watched The Thundermans Return. I actually watched The Thundermans on Nickelodeon when I was definitely too old to be watching kids shows. But I don't care. It was fun. I liked the movie. It was pretty okay. Um, I like that it's the same cast. Everybody came back. They did it in the same style. They just did it as a movie. It was really cool, really exciting to get the Thundermans back. I just don't understand why they did it three years later instead of five, like it has been, after the end of the Thundermans. But no complaints, really, honestly. It was a pretty good movie. And then, of course, finally, anyone but you. So I actually watched it twice. I just watched it again today, and I watched it last night. So I had to rent anyone but you. So I paid like $5 for it. So I was like, I'm going to watch it twice. My goal with that was to get my mom to watch it, but she didn't really watch it, so... Um, anyway, I thought this movie was hilarious, and when I say I want a rom-com, like, this is what I want. I want a movie where it's funny, it has the romance factor, and I love this kind of thing, where it's, like, enemies to lovers, like, kind of stuff. But, like, they weren't enemies, like, they, it's actually, like, first, love at first sight, and they really did like each other in the beginning, but she left and then she overheard him say some stuff that they didn't really mean and so they like didn't get along and then they go to his best friend and her sister's wedding and they have to like get along so they decide to fake being together and there are some funny scenes in this obviously the most notable is the spider scene but there's also the airplane scene i don't want to talk about it because i want you guys to watch the movie i don't want to spoil it but oh my god it's so funny I was cracking up laughing at this movie and I honestly thought when I watched it I was like oh I'm probably gonna know exactly what's gonna happen 
all the time and I'm gonna expect exactly what kind of funny moments they're gonna have everything because I've seen so many stuff so much stuff on TikTok and I was still pleasantly surprised and of course the song Unwritten being the song of this movie was my favorite thing ever because that is such a good song and now it's never leaving my head ever again and it's my serenity song if you know you know so that is all for this week's podcast thank you so much for watching or listening and I'll see you see or no, I guess I'll see you for the next one.